So, you can, if you want to, the main topic this morning is 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. Um, I sent out an email with the, the points, and there's a lot of cross-references that you can follow along. If you didn't get one, there, there are those out there that are printed off. But as we do that, um, I want to I get us thinking a, about a couple thoughts this morning. First of all, I want us to think about somebody completely independent, not needing anything else, but creating something for their own pleasure and purpose. And of course, you'll, well, let me go ahead and, let me go ahead and read this to you right now. I was going to read it later, but let me read it from Radical, page 65, David Platt's book. Um, I just, I love the way he says it about God and who God is, right? And, and one of the things I want us to understand is that God doesn't need us. Do you understand that? Church, do you get that? God doesn't need us. Like somehow we fulfill God. No, we don't fulfill God. God is a dependent. God doesn't need us. He's self-sufficient. And so I want to think, I want us to get us thinking this morning. If he doesn't need us, why did he create us? And why did he save us? Listen to what, listen to what David says. I just think this is beautiful. It says, consider why God formed us in the first place. As the self-sufficient God of the universe, he certainly had no unmet need in himself. So why did he create us? The last thing I want to do is presume to know exhaustively the mind and motives of God, nor do I want to oversimplify his ways. But it seems that God tells us why he made us. There's a twofold purpose evident from the beginning of history. On one hand, we are created by God to enjoy his grace. Apart from everything else God created, we were made in his image. We alone have the capacity to enjoy God in an intimate relationship with him. The first word the Bible uses to describe the relationship is blessing. God blesses the human race, not because of any merit or inherent worth in us, but simply out of pure, unadulterated grace. God created humankind to enjoy his grace. But that was not the end of the story, because on the other hand, God immediately following his blessing with a command said, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. God gave his people the image for a reason, so they might multiply his image throughout the world. He created human beings not only to enjoy his grace in a relationship with him, but to extend his glory to the ends of the earth. Simply enough, enjoy his grace extend his glory. This is the twofold purpose behind the creation of the human race in Genesis 1, and it sets the stage for the entire book that revolves around the same purpose. In every genre of biblical literature, in every stage of biblical history, God is seen pouring out his grace on his people for the sake of his glory among the peoples. And then he goes on to talk about illustrations of that, and he mentions Abraham. The Bible tells us in Genesis 12 that he, he blessed Abraham so that he would be a vehicle of blessing to the entire world, right? And then I, I came up with some other illustrations. Israel and Egypt. Think about him taking them out of Egypt to the promised land, right? He did it so that he could be made known. Right? And he used Pharaoh in the midst of that so that he could flex his muscles and show Pharaoh who really was God and who wasn't. So he did it, we see in Exodus, so that the nations would know that he was God. And then I think about individual stories in Scripture. I think about the three U's. I think about Daniel in the lion's den. Why did he rescue the three U's from the fiery furnace? Why did he rescue Daniel from the lion's den, to show that he was God, to extend his glory through that circumstance. And it was through those two situations that Nebuchadnezzar began to recognize who God was, and so did Darius. And then Nehemiah uh, 6.16. Let me, just, let me just read this for you. Nehemiah, when's the last time you were in the book of Nehemiah, right? And by the way, I don't know about you, but Nehemiah is not a prophet. Right, We always want to look for Nehemiah and the prophets, but he actually was not a prophet. Um, let's see if I can find him here. He gets lost 
Uh, okay. Trying to find him. Nehemiah. Do I have to go to the front of my Bible to find him? There we go. Ezra and Nehemiah. Yeah, what's the last time I was in Nehemiah, right? Just recently. But if you go to Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 16, um, they're building the wall. And by the way, miraculously, they're able to finish the wall in Jerusalem, which was completely torn down, in 53 days. Amazing. Amazing. Only by the hand of God. In 616, it says, When all of our enemies heard of it and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence, for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. So all the way through scripture, we see examples of God, how God wants to use people for his purpose, and that is to make his name great. Now, unless somebody were to stop and say, well, doesn't that make God egocentric? Because, you know, you get that occasionally. When you tell people it's all about God's glory, you get people that say, well, isn't that kind of selfish and egocentric? Yeah, it would be if it were us, but not with God because of who God is, right? God deserves the glory and demands glory. And you know what? He should get the glory, right? And then I also want us to get to thinking about this as well this morning. I want us to think about experiencing something amazing, something that's happened to us. Maybe somebody's done something for us. And we want to tell everyone about it rather than being selfish and keeping it to ourselves, especially with the idea that we know that others could benefit from it. Now, in light of all of this, what have we experienced and for what reason? So if you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, okay, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Listen to what God says to his people, and this would have been the, tribe, the tribes that were scattered among the nations, but it's also for the Gentiles as well. Because we have been brought into that new covenant. Listen to what he says. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are, I love this, the people of God. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I love those articles, those definite articles. The, not a people of God, not one of many peoples of God. You are the people of God. Do you know that's who you are if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? You are part of the people of God. So what have we experienced and for what reason? And I love this. I love if those of you who are reading the book Radical, and, and you look on page 69, but also you look at the subtitle, I love the title, The Great Why of God. The Great Why of God. Going back to that question, why in the world, if God is completely sufficient, self-contained, and was there from, well, let's put it this way, he was never a time when God wasn't because he's eternal, all by himself for all this time, why in the world did he need to create us? Why is there a sense of why he created us and why he saved us? Now think about this one. The other night, I had the privilege of watching the graduation service for Granger Christian School, where I used to teach. And oftentimes, I will think back to, to, to interactions that I had with students years ago, and for those who are teachers, Christy, and I know you probably get this all the time from your students, I don't know how many times kids would ask me, so Mr. Garnett, if God is omniscient and God knew that man was going to do what they did in the garden, why in the world did he create them? Why in the world would God, you know, so you think about that in light of all this, in light of the fact that God is self-sufficient, God doesn't need anyone else, why in the world would you create these human beings in your image that would almost immediately mar your image. And then you'd have to recreate them. Why? Well, we're going to see this morning from this particular text. Okay, so let's look. First of all, first of all, what, what have we experienced and 
For what reason? If you're taking notes and if you're following along, we see the first point is God's pleasure. God's pleasure. We are his possession from his mercy. His possession. Now, hopefully today you'll walk away from this and you'll say, if I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this should make me feel pretty darn special. If you're here today and you're struggling, or if you're watching today and you're struggling with who you are and your identity in Christ as a believer, today, I hope you walk away going, you are loved, you are special, you are precious. Let me ask you a question. Does anybody here ever struggle as a, even a strong believer in the Lord Jesus with your identity? with who you are, because you've got the enemy coming against you all the time, trying to beat you down. And then you know what? He loves to cooperate with your flesh who does the same thing. And then the world is telling you all this garbage. You talk about the battle. Today, I want you to walk away knowing as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are part of God's pleasure and you are his possession completely from his mercy. Right? Listen to what he says. And, and by the way, I gave you some cross-references. Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, 19 through 22. That's Paul talking to the Gentiles. By the way, do we have any re reformed, or not reformed Jews, but do we have any completed Jews here today? Anybody have any Jewish background? And I'll know. So we're all, I'm talking a whole group of Gentiles, right? Paul's talking to this group of Gentiles, and he tells them who they used to be, who they are now, all because of the blood of Christ. They've been brought near by the blood of Jesus. So that's a cross-reference. But listen to what Peter tells us. I love this. He says, you are, first of all, a chosen race. Do you know what the word means in the Greek, chosen race? It literally means you are a distinguished offspring. Wow, a distinguished offspring chosen by God himself, right? And if you look at Ephesians 1, 4 and John 15, 16, and we looked at John 15, 16, uh, either last week or the week before, Jesus says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you, right? Ephesians 1, 4 says, as believers, we are chosen before the foundation of the world. Now, you may not you may struggle with that concept about being chosen, because we all do. You know what? I don't have to understand the idea of being chosen to know that I'm chosen. Right, church? I don't have to understand all the theological implications about what it means to be chosen, or how did God do this or not do that. All I need to know is I'm chosen and elect by God. Right? That's all that matters. Right? That gives me my identity. So we're a distinguished offspring, right? Then he goes on to say we're a royal priesthood, right? And, and, and this idea of a, he's thinking about priesthood. He's thinking about the Old Testament. He thought about what was the purpose of the priesthood back in the Old Testament? The priests were intermediaries between God and man. They were the ones that go between, between God and man. And their job was to offer sacrifices to God on behalf of the people that would be acceptable so that God could have that, in a sense, somewhat temporary restored relationship before Christ came, right? So you're a royal priest, and it's the idea of you have royal dignity. You have royal dignity to offer spiritual sacrifice. Think about that. If you're struggling with your identity at all this morning, you're a royal priesthood, right? You are handpicked by God to be his intermediary, to offer sacrifices to him, and to... Be the link between God and people. Do, do you, does that make you feel special at all, church? I, man, I, I just, I, I, I stop and try to thank God every day. That if it were not for him, and it wasn't God's good pleasure, and I wasn't his possession, owned by God for his mercy, to be used by God, heavens knows where I'd be today. Heavens knows where I would be today. But thank God, because of the fact that I am part of his royal priesthood, along with other believers, that I get the privilege of standing here declaring God's word to you today. Wow! 
That makes me feel pretty darn special, right? 1 Peter 2.5 uh, talks about being that priesthood. We are, we're a household of priests being built into this household to minister to God and to minister to other people on behalf of God. Revelation 1.6 calls us that priesthood as well. We are going to be serving as priests on the earth one day for God. We are his representative priests between God and man. Don't you think that's incredible? Then he goes on to say, you're a holy nation. The word holy means set apart for a sacred use. We are a holy nation. God's nation, his church, his people to be set apart. And the word Ephesians 1, 4 talks about the fact that the reason why we were set apart is to be holy and blameless before him. As these priests, as this holy nation, as his chosen ways, guess who you represent, church? You don't represent you any longer. You represent the God of the universe who picked you out to be used for his glory. Does that like stir anybody's spirit at all to think about that? Then he goes on to say, you are a peculiar people for God's own possession. This is really interesting. In the Greek, in the Greek, it means the idea of purchasing for oneself with a peculiar price isn't that interesting so the the focus here is not the fact that we're peculiar which by the way people have accused me of being peculiar before <laughs> you're pretty peculiar what they're really saying is you're strange and I'm going yep I sure am God calls me a peculiar people but what he's talking about here is the idea that there's a there's a purchase that's been made so that God can have us for his own possession so that we no longer belong to ourselves, but we belong to him. He's our master. We are his servants, right? And if you look at 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, he tells us, listen, you weren't redeemed with silver and gold, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of the lamb that we sang about earlier, church. That's the peculiar price that was paid for us. The world looks at it and goes, we don't get it. We think we're going to get to heaven on our good works, right? I mean, how many people do we know that think they're going to heaven just because they do good works, because they sit in church on Sunday morning? That's an absolute bunch of lies from the pit of hell. We've been studying about that in Romans, right? For those who've been here on Thursday night, we've been studying. About, there is only one way to be saved, and that's faith in Jesus Christ alone Getting rid of your own wretchedness, understanding that your wretchedness and your righteousness doesn't please God, but only his precious blood pays and atones for our sins. That's the peculiar price that was paid. And I love this, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. I'm just going to turn there for a second. This is a verse that has been so important so meaningful to me over the years. It's one that I have shared with people on many occasions. Um, but I, I absolutely love this. Listen to what Paul says as he's writing to these immoral Christians in Cor Corinth. He says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've had from God, and that you are not your own? What's he saying there? You're a possession. You belong to somebody else. You're no longer your own. The moment we come to know Christ, we no longer are on our own doing our own things. We surrender to Jesus Christ and deny ourselves and follow him and lay down our agenda for his agenda. We are not our own. He says, you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. What price do you think it was that was paid to buy us? And by the way, if we're living, if we claim to have trusted Christ for salvation and, and we are living still for ourselves, then what we've basically just done is spit on the purchase price of Jesus Christ. We've just said, you know, thank you for the fire insurance or whatever, but I'm going to go do whatever I want. But if we truly understand, church, that we've been bought with the most precious price in the world that could be paid and it could only be paid by one. Not us, but him, right? We will understand our salvation that much better. And then he goes on to say, Peter says, now you are the people of God. 
Though once you were not a people, Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, 19 through 22, 1 Peter 2, 5, you, you now, you're the people of God. Not a people of God. You are the people of God. Anybody in here saved this morning? Anybody here know for a fact they're saved without a question, without a shadow of a doubt, right? Guess what, church? We are the people of God. And guess who else is part of that? Anybody else who has trusted Christ alone for salvation with that purchase price, we are together corporately the people of God, which means you are not alone. Do you know that? You know one of the enemy's greatest tactics is to get Christians separated from the body. Christians separated from fellowship. And I don't, no, 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 no offense to the, the fellowship we do beforehand with the cookies and stuff. That's not what it's talking about. From the fellowship, the intimate relationship we have with each other, building those relationships around Jesus Christ. We are the body together. And the greatest thing that Satan can do is to isolate you away from the body. Let me give you a quick illustration. Years ago, there was a man in our congregation in Michigan who came to me one day and said, Pastor, I'm deeply concerned for my cousin. He goes to another church. Um, he hasn't been going to church for probably four or five months. Would you be willing to go with me and reach out to him? Sure. What am I? I'm a priest, right? I'm going to minister to my, my brother in Christ. We went to his house. And I told him, I said, you know what, brother? I said to his cousin, I said, brother, I said, what Satan is doing right now is he's getting you isolated on your own because if he can get you isolated, he can keep you ineffective. Right? He was, he was in a funk. He was in a spiritual funk. He was kind of depressed and God, the enemy had gotten into his head. God sent me there to wake him up by the power of the Holy Spirit, brought him to life, and he was back in fellowship with his church the next week. Right? That's what God is calling us to do. But if the enemy can isolate us, right? We are the body, even though we once weren't. Then he goes on to say, now you have received mercy, though once you hadn't received mercy. Where have we received mercy? Through Jesus Christ. By the way, grace and mercy, I don't know if you've heard me ever say this, but grace and mercy are two sides of one coin. Grace is the idea of uh, receiving what you don't deserve. We talked about that last week. Mercy is not receiving what you should get. They're the two sides of the same coin. So he says, where does that mercy come from? It comes through Jesus Christ. And I want you to hear something. This is interesting. Um, I went, I looked up the word mercy. I, for those who do word studies, those who understand the importance of word studies, I did a word study on this. And the word mercy, it means this. Sympathy. Feeling for the misfortunes of others, but an active desire to remove those miseries. You say, well, well that's nice, Pastor, but what, you know, what's the big deal? Because later on, when we look at the word darkness, who called you out of darkness, the word darkness means sin and misery. So what was the mercy received for? To effectively deal with our, our miseries, our sin and our misery, and the destruction that sin was bringing into our lives, and the ultimate destruction that it would have in our lives in separating us from God for all eternity. You, you didn't have that once, but now you've got it. You've got God's active compassion. That's what, that's what mercy means, right? It's different than pity. It's interesting. It's easy to look at somebody, you know, like if you've ever walked by a homeless person before on the street, it's easy to walk by that person and go, oh, I feel sorry for them. And then do absolutely nothing for them. Compassion here or mercy is active pity. It's going, you know what? I feel sorry for that. I'm going to do something about it. That's what it's talking about here. God, through his son, Jesus Christ, gave us his active pity. He gave us his, he could have looked at us and said, oh, look at that Tony. He's a wretched sinner. You know, what a, what a pitiful state and what a miserable state he's in. Yeah, whatever. No. No, no, God so loved the world that he looked at Tony and he looked at Jim and he looked at Christy and he looked at Lisa and he looked at Caleb 
And he looked at the world and said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's active pity, church. That's mercy. We live in the mercy of God. So that's God's good pleasure. We become his possession completely out of his mercy. This is all God's doing on our behalf. We have nothing to do with this. This is all God's doing on our behalf. And this is, this is where the title of the message came from, experiencing God's grace. This is us experiencing God's grace. The only thing we bring to this table is we receive the grace. That's it. It's all God's doing, right? So we are God's pleasure, possession from his mercy. All God's doing, we are experiencing God's grace. But secondly, secondly, we have not only God's pleasure, but we have God's purpose. Okay? So why did he save us? God's purpose. His proclamation for his magnification. Okay? And I gave you a cross-reference in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, which we, we looked at, we, I, I preached through a number of months ago, right? But basically the essence of it is, um, blessed be the God and Father who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It's all about the heavenly things that he has done for us, right? Listen to what Peter goes on to say. We, have, we, 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 we see all this in Peter... And I, I love this phrase. Um, I don't know how many of you pay attention to this phrase when you're studying, but I do. Anytime I see the phrase, so that, it's a term of conclusion, and it gives the purpose or reason statement for what was said previously. So if you're paying close attention to the scripture, he's just said, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, you weren't the people of God. Now you're the people of God. Now you receive mercy, though once you hadn't. So that. There's a purpose. There's a reason for it. Not so that you could walk around and go, well, look at me. Look who I am. I'm, you know. It's not about you. It was never about you. It was never about any of us. It was all about God's glory. We in the church today need to get out of this idea that it's all about us. It is never about us. It is all about the glory of God. And we just, by his mercy, get to be part of that. Do you think it's time to stop, stop focusing on ourselves and start giving God the glory that he deserves in our lives? One thing you can know about me is that you will never, ever, ever hear me say it's all about me. Because I understand it's not about me. It's not about us, right? And you might be offended. You might walk out today and say, well, pastor, you didn't make me feel good about myself today. No, I'm not here to make you feel good about yourself. In one sense, I'm here to speak the truth to you about who God is and who we are in his place. By the way, do you know, do you know that you have experienced God's grace, not because you deserve it, but only because God allows it? Do you realize that if it weren't for the Lord today, you know where you would be? 20 bucks says, and I'm not a betting guy, but 20 bucks says if you had not experienced the grace of God in salvation, you would not be sitting in a church today. I know I wouldn't have been. I know what I'd be doing, right? I like sleep, right? And before I got saved, I spent many a Sunday morning usually having to sleep something off, right? The reason why I'm here this morning you say, well, you're a pastor because we pay you and you're our preacher. No, I'm here today because of what God has done. But I don't know about you. I wouldn't be anywhere else if it weren't for God's grace, right? So that, and, and this, is the, this gives us the reason that we've received these things from God. It's not for us, but for him and others, right? So that, now, uh, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him. So you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a people who've received mercy, who now are part of God's people, so that you're, did you know you, this is your job description? You always wonder, what's my job as a Christian? Your job description is right here. You are made part of God's people 
out of his incredible mercy, bought with a price, made his possession for one purpose, and that is that you could be his priest to proclaim the ex his excellencies. By the way, do you believe God is excellent? Notice it's not just excellent, his excellent hood or excellentness. It's excellencies. It's in the plural. There are all kinds of wonderful things about God that we are to be declaring. Now, here we go. I'm going to bring it back into Bible study. You go, here goes pastor again. How in the world can you declare his excellencies if you don't know who he is in his word? How? I feel inept. I feel like I'm falling short at times in declaring who he is. And I'm in the Bible all the time. Right? You've got to understand who God is, who his character, what, is, what he's all about. Right? And, and the excellencies of him would be his moral excellencies, his goodness. And it could really be any of his character qualities. Now, let me take you to a couple of cross-references. Right? By the way, the word proclaim means to publish or declare abroad. It's, it's where we get the word preaching. It's the word proclamation, right? Show me anywhere in Scripture that pa the pastor is the only one that preaches. The gospel. We all are supposed to be preaching the gospel. We're all supposed to be proclaiming the goodness of God because of what he's done and what he's allowed us to become. We're to proclaim that, declare it, shout it from the mountaintop, right? Listen to this. I, a couple, couple scriptures. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 22. I want to show you that one. So Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36. And this is talking about Israel. Think about how God had set apart Israel for his purposes. And they were expected to be a light to the nations. And what's scary is many times the rebuked is not only were they not a light, but they were actually worse than the pagan nations they were supposed to be declaring the light to. Ouch. That's God saying about his own chosen people. By the way, I love the Jews. They're God's chosen people, but I'm just telling you the truth about what God says about them, right? So they're supposed to be declaring, and, and, and they're not. So listen to what he says in uh, 36, 22. I love it. This is about... This is about scattering among the nations and then bringing them back in the, out of, after the captivity. Well, let me just look at this. Um, verse 20. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have, yet they have come out of his, his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of the Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. Listen to what God says. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, he's telling Ezekiel this, Thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. God, I'm going to act, but it's not because you're good. It's not because you're so wonderful. I'm going to act on your behalf for my glory and my name's sake alone. Now, if he's going to tell that to Israel, his chosen people, guess what he's going to say to the church, right? I'm acting on your behalf, not so you're going to look good and you're going to you know, have your name in lights. I'm doing it through you and for you so that my name would be on the marquee, not yours. That should be our, that should be our cry every day as believers, church. That it's all about the glory of God. It's not about me. Can we stop just and get real for a second? How many of us who are living for God, who are serving him and our giftedness, every once in a while, if we're honest, we'll say, yeah, but God, I want to get a little credit here. Look at me. I'm faithful. I'm your ver vessel. Am I the only one that's ever felt that way in here? <laughs> Anybody else want to confess to that? And God reminds me, no, 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 Jim. No, no, I share my glory with no one. Ouch. So I've had to train my mind and remind myself that the giftings that God has given me to serve him by serving other people through his word is ultimately all for his glory and for their good. Boy, talk about needing to be humble, right? No, it's not about me. 
Now, will God honor us for bringing him the glory? Absolutely. God will exalt, God will honor, but let God be the one to do it, not us, right? He will honor his children who are faithful to him. And then I gave you a bunch of other scriptures, and we're going to actually end with Psalm 67. That's another one that points this out, that we, the idea that we proclaim his excellencies. What, who, oh, Isaiah 43, 21, to proclaim his excellencies. So Isaiah, if I go backwards, Isaiah, or, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 41, uh, 43, verse 21. Listen to what this verse says. says, the people whom I form for myself will declare my praise. The people who I have formed for myself, my possession, their job is to declare my praise. Now that's of Israel, but do you think it's true of the church as well? The people who, he, who become his possession will declare his praise. And you know what? What I wrote down here just a couple of days ago. He is counting on us to declare his praise. Have you ever felt like God was counting on me? He was waiting for me. He was counting on me to do something. Folks, he, brothers and sisters, he's counting on us. He depends on us. He doesn't need us, but he depends on us. He's given us that privilege right, to declare his praise. He's counting on us, right? I don't know about you, but remember in the triumphal entry when the Pharisees rebuked the disciples? Hey, tell those children to stop praising him. Stop praising him. And I love Jesus' response. He says, if they don't praise me, the rocks and trees will cry out because they know who I am. Think about this. We were created in the image of God. Rocks and trees can't receive salvation. They can't receive mercy, right? Only we can. Are you going to let the rocks and trees church beat you to the praise? Absolutely not. I'm going to beat them to the punch. Why? Because I've experienced the grace and mercy that a tree could never experience. We are the only part of creation that can ever experience his salvation. Animals can't. And I know some of you are dog lovers. We, we talked earlier today. I love dogs. Don't get me wrong. Animals can't experience his salvation, his grace and mercy. The creation can't. Only we can as image bearers, are we going to let them outpraise us? No, 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 no. We need to praise, and God counts on us. What? We need to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Called us out of darkness. The word darkness here has a, a, a number of ramifications. It, in essence, means spiritual darkness. He calls us out of spiritual darkness. In this particular text, it means sin and misery, right? W would you say that before Christ, you were walking in sin and misery? I know I was. As I look back now, I look at what, right? We're dead in our sins. You know, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2. And we were living in sin and misery. We might have thought it was a great time, but it was nothing but sin and misery as we look back now, right? He called us out of that. And again, how did he call us? He called us out of his sympathy. He looked at us. He saw us in our sin and misery and wanted to do something about it. And he acted on our behalf. And because of that, we have received his grace and mercy to be able to declare his praises. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Colossians 1.13, he put us from one kingdom to the other. Acts 26.18, Paul says, it's my job to declare the praises to the Gentiles, to declare the gospel to the Gentiles, to get them out of darkness into the light, which is who we are, right? And then who, who are we to proclaim? And by the way, the, the, the word marvelous light, it means the true knowledge of God that enlightens, right? It gets us out of the darkness the world's way of thinking and gets us into God's understanding of who he is that brings us light in term, terms of our relationship with him. And then if you look at 1 Peter 2, 7 and 8, 
he says, he talks about the chief cornerstone. He says, this precious value then is for those who believe. But for those who disbelieve, this, the stone which the builders rejected, that became the very cornerstone and a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Now he's talking there to the Jews and he's talking about the Jews who have rejected, have stumbled over the Messiah. But by application, it could be anybody who's rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah. Church, right? We are to preach the gospel. We are to give them an invitation to respond and accept those who are stumbling over the true Messiah of God. Now, this is, this is our doing on God's behalf. We are extending God's glory. And the question is, what can we do because of what has been done for us? So we have God's pleasure his possession from his mercy, that's his doing on our behalf, experiencing God's grace. Then there's God's purpose, his proclamation for his magnification from our hat, that's our behalf, and that's extending God's glory. Let me end by reading some quotes from Radical again. This is just absolutely, I just, I don't know, if you read this, you, you kind of get convicted a little bit. Did anybody get convicted as they were reading this at all? It's absolutely amazing. Because David's right on, right? David's right on. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. My, I have intense grief over the state of the American church today, over the modern church. Intense grief. Because we have shamed, as a, as a modern church, and we have to include ourselves in it at some point, like Daniel did in his confessions, we have shamed the name of our God. We have not declared his excellencies. We have shamed his name by false teaching, by wrong living. I mean, you look at all these rock star pastors who have just fallen recently into sexual immorality, right? And you just look at the false doctrine that's coming out of so many pulpits. We have shamed the name of Jesus Christ, the one who purchased us by his blood to make us his possession, to be used for his glory. We've shamed him, church. And all I know is, what can we do? If we've done that in our own personal lives, we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your forgiveness. I confess that I've done something that is, that's brought honor and shame and shame to your dishonor and shame to your name lord i want to be used of you i want glory your glory to be my primary motivation and i want you to be glorified in me that's where we can start church but listen to what he says as god blesses his people with extravagant grace so they might he they might extend his extravagant glory to all the peoples of the earth we live in a church culture that's dangerous tendency to disconnect the grace of God from the glory of God. Boy, is that true, right? And he goes on to say, um, if that grace is disconnected from its purpose, the sad result is self-centered Christianity that bypasses the heart of God. And I'll just leave it at that. If we disconnect the grace of God from the glory of God, that it becomes nothing but self-centered focus on us. But if we understand God's extravagant grace, that it's to be used to extend his extravagant glory, then we are in the right place. Let me just remind us as we close it up. We are God's pleasure and possession by his mercy alone. Do you understand that today, church? Do you understand that the only reason you're saved is because he wanted to save you? Not because you've done anything good. It's not I've done anything good. It's because he loves us and he felt pity on us and he acted upon it and we got brought into this incredible relationship so that we could experience God's grace, not only in salvation in the beginning, but we could experience God's grace every single day. The grace in which we stand, according to Romans 5.1. And the purpose is that we are to proclaim and magnify his name. What are we doing for Jesus today? And I'll, I'll, I'll end by saying this. He saved us to use us for his glory. And there was a... a time years ago 
when I wanted to preach a, 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 a title, I wanted to preach a message called Save to Serve, Not to Sit. Well, this is kind of the closest I've gotten to that. We were saved to serve, not to sit. To extend his glory to the earth and all those who need his incredible grace today.